Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text this morning is all of chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. I'll just read a few select passages first. After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, and they cried, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you servants, you who fear him, both great and small. And the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, as we gather into God's house this morning to sing praises to his holy name, we come to the conclusion of another church year, Christ the King Sunday. As we look at the 19th chapter here of the book of Revelation, we see a number of occasions where we see the picture of the people praising God. As a matter of fact, the use of the word Alleluia, only used four times in Scripture, or in the New Testament, I should say, and only in these verses here in the 19th chapter. Alleluia, praise the Lord. It was an expression of, of majesty and angelic in its thought that it's intent, and then the worship here of the people that were gathered around the throne. Wondrous, thunderous, the roar of the people. There was enthusiasm, there was excitement, there was the awesome splendor of being in the presence of the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain for the forgiveness of sins. What joy was there to participate. And not only do we think of the people that were gathered there, but we, we think of who they were. These are those who have come out of the great tribulation, namely those who have suffered in various ways. We think of the many people through the years who were martyred for the Christian faith and are still being martyred today for the Christian faith. There they are in all of their glory and, and the splendor of, of God's majesty, worshiping and praising him. We think of our loved ones who battled cancer. And in the latter days of their lives, it was not pleasant to watch them as they appeared and weak and feeble and unable to do things. And now we see them before the Lamb of God, praising him in the glorious song of victory that is theirs. We think of the many people who struggled in their faith life. We think of the 11th hour Christians who came to know Jesus in the latter days of their lives here on earth, all gathered before the throne. If you see the pictures of worship in the Bible, never do you see or never is the thought expressed, huh, this is dull, this is boring. Same old song again today. Same old refrain. No, you don't see any of that. Because... These individuals knew who they were worshiping. And I think that makes all the difference in our worship life. Whenever we hear those, and I hear it a lot, oh, your liturgical order of service, it's dull, it's boring, it's dreary. We do the same things over and over again. I dare say, without trying to be too critical here, you don't understand who you're worshiping. They were shouting out, salvation and glory and honor belong to you. Salvation. There is no other name under heaven whereby man can be saved except through Jesus Christ and through his shed blood. To be cleansed with the blood of Christ. Do you know what that means? To know that we have the righteousness of Christ. That we'll be singing praises to him before his heavenly throne. And now we have that opportunity to have but just a foretaste of the glory of heaven in our worship and our praise. Honor, to honor him as God, to honor and to respect him and to give the, the awe and, and to, to give that recognition of, of his greatness. 
The glory, the glory, it, it comes from a term that means a heaviness. The, 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 just the, the total completeness of God. We come into his house and in our small way, with our voices, we raise our praise to him. And so also we join that heavenly chorus and say, salvation belongs to you. We come here to honor you. We come here to worship you. We come here to praise you. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Lord, hear my praises. Hear my cries for help. You are my salvation. And there they were gathered. The Lord gives us these pictures. He wants us to see this. He wants us to understand this. Although you may suffer for a time here on earth, the glory that shall be revealed is beyond understanding. It makes the suffering of our present time hardly worth mentioning. And so we come into that house, into this house, with that spirit, that spirit of worship, as we see these individuals sound like the roar of a great multitude. The 24 elders and those fell down and worshiped God. And they were seated on the throne. They cried out, Hallelujah. The voice came, Praise the Lord. I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and loud pearls of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, the Lord our God. <coughs> Never do we see in Scripture of those who were worshiping the Lord a spirit of despair except for those who really didn't want to be there who really what didn't think it was worth their time we know in the Old Testament those people who would bring their careless offerings to the Lord such a showing of disrespect that it was hardly worthy of their time and effort to come to the temple. Don't let it be you. Understand, appreciate what the Lord has done for you and for your salvation. Understand that your loved ones who have fought the fight, who have gone from the church militant to the church triumphant, understand and see them praising God. One of the common things I hear from people who are shut in I wish I could come back to church again. I wish I could come there on Sunday. I wish I could be there. I've heard from my mother almost every time I go up there, it sure would be nice to go back to church again, to be there and sit with the people in the worship. Yes, we now bring church to our shut-ins. We bring the word to them. We still bring communion to them. We bring the word of God to them. But like they say, it's, it's not the same. It's not the same as being in God's house. Friends, it should not take the, the debilitating circumstances in our life where we can't come because of health reasons to keep us from God's house. It shouldn't be that reminder then that I need to worship you and get together with my fellow believers Note the joy of these people worshiping. Joy should fill your hearts as you come into his house. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready. Come to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb, he added. Perhaps we miss some of the beauty of what is said there. Let's go back and, and consider what the Jewish customs for weddings was at this time, and perhaps that will help us to better appreciate that. There are two key things or events within the Jewish wedding. The betrothal, for me to say, the betrothal, and then the, the wedding itself. To be betrothed to the one, that commitment, that promise, that was generally done years in advance of the wedding, probably from childhood, where the individual was set apart for, for the other, the man and the woman. And from that time on, there was just a general consideration. You would be faithful to your spouse until the time of the wedding. So you were betrothed, 
And then there would be, after a period of sometimes many years, the wedding. On the wedding day, a crowd would go, those invited to the wedding, would go to the bride's home, who now the bride had made herself ready to be brought to her husband. They would take the bride and bring the bride over to the husband's house, and there would be a huge banquet. As in Jewish custom, it was the most beautiful of all the feasts and banquets that they had. This was the big event, if you will. And so the bride would be brought there, and then they would have the celebration, the wedding feast. And for those that were invited to this, this was special. You were honored. You were honored by the hosts to be present there. And you celebrated with them. The picture of the church, we the bride. We have been betrothed to our Lord when we came to faith. Awaiting for that time when the Lord will come back on Judgment Day to get us and to bring us to the heavenly banquet, the heavenly wedding feast. What an honor to be a part of that feast. What an honor to be invited to the heavenly banquet by our Lord Jesus Christ. And note too, don't lose the symbolism here, the bride who had adorned herself in white linens, white, bright, and clean, were given her to wear. You and I have been given the robe of righteousness of our Lord, white and clean, and showing that we have the forgiveness of sins, and then to be brought to that wedding feast in heaven. What a blessing that is. What comfort that has brought thousands, if not millions of people through the years as they thought of the loss of their loved ones, now partaking of the wedding feast of the, of the Lamb in heaven. What peace there is in that. What joy there is. And we see this picture, how the Lord spells it out. And time again, he says in Scripture, we the church is bride, he the heavenly bridegroom. You know, that relationship between that we get in marriage between the husband and the wife, that bond, that closeness, that oneness, that unity. It was often pictured in the scriptures that the Lord gives to us. The latter verses of chapter 19 of Revelation is why I tell people who want to start reading their Bible and find a place in the Bible where they can start reading and, and to get into the Bible, don't start in Revelation. The latter part of chapter 19 shows the Lord coming back in all of his victor. What I mean by that is the Lord was treated shamefully here on earth. He was laughed at. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He was scorned. He was taken to his death on the cross. And all the while they were spitting on him, putting a crown of thorns on him, and doing everything they could to make sport of him. The Lord of all, the God of creation, the Savior of all people, treated such a, a fashion by, by individuals here on earth. Rude, vulgar people. And so to this day, yet Christianity and the Christian are still being persecuted by the, by the world. We are the strange ones. We are the extremists. We are the ones that don't like this and don't like that. And all types of accusations are made against us. The latter part of chapter 19 shows the lamb returning, not this time as that meek lamb, but as the conquering hero who will slay the enemy before him. There will come a time when those who mock the Lord and those who, who reject the Lord will know the victor. They will know the lamb. And you see that, the king of kings and the lord of lords, and you go on to read this, how he wages war against those who opposed him. And he, and he ends the chapter with, Blessed are those who have been invited to the feast. And for those who have not been invited to the feast, they will be cast off forever in hell. Yes, the Lord comes back this time, not as the one who now brings a second chance to any, but as the one who now issues judgment against those. And that's always a sad thing to know that 
those who will not in this lifetime embrace Christ nor recognize him as their savior to be lost forever. We don't like that thought. We like to cushion that thought by saying that, um, well, in the end, God's going to love everyone, take them to heaven. That's not the God of Scripture. Christ the King, he rules over the world. And while for a long time people laughed at him and mocked, on his second return, there will be no more laughing. There will be this thunderous roar of the saints, those who accept and believe in him as their Savior and Lord, the thunderous praise of them, and then you'll hear the cries and the weeping and gnashing of teeth of those who will be forever separated from God in eternal punishment. Christ the King Sunday, as we view these thoughts and as, as we picture what the Lord is saying to us here, he gives us opportunity, and so when he says, now is the day of salvation, now is the opportunity to come to know me as my Savior, as your Savior. Receive me, cling to me, cling to my cross, for when I come back again, I will bring judgment. I am the Lord of all. I am the King of kings, he says. And for those invited, what a thunderous praise it will be. And so, dear friends, let every day be that day of praise for you. Let every worship service be that opportunity where you come in and say, thank you, Lord. And I think if you bear in mind each time as you come into God's house and you think salvation belongs to you, all glory belongs to you, all power is yours, and we come and we sit and worship him, our worship will never be meaningless or dull or boring. It will always be filled with a sense of awe and majesty for the one who created us, who redeemed us, who sanctifies and keeps us, and will one day bring us to the mansions on high that he has prepared from eternity for each of us. Amen. <clears throat> Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in a true faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. If you can open your hymnals, please, to page 41. We join together with the Christian Church confessing our faith.